GSE SS8H3 analyze the role of Georgia in the American Revolutionary Era. Specifically, we're going to look at 3.A today, explain the causes of the American Revolution as they impacted Georgia. Again, this class is called Georgia Studies. So we got to talk about the French and Indian War, the Proclamation of 1763, and the Stamp Act, all in today's video. It's going to take a little while. We're going to skip the videos, but again, if you want to watch these videos, make sure you go to exceedthestandard.com and you will find our videos there. So Georgia's place in the Revolutionary War history compared to all the other colonies. Remember, there are 13 colonies. Georgia's pretty much the youngest, smallest, and the poorest of all of the colonies. So our role in the American Revolution um, was pretty much a minor one. We were the only colony to sell stamps during the Stamp Act crisis, which we're going to get to at the end of this video. We were the only colony to do it because we didn't want to upset the king. Uh, we were too loyal to the royal. We were too loyal to the king. And we were the only colony out of all 13. We were the only colony to not send a representative to the first Continental Congress two years before we declare independence in 1774. We're also joining the we join the war and when we do our city of savannah is recaptured by the british which we'll get to later and our coastal cities are now controlled by great britain all the way through the american revolution to the end of the american revolutionary war so we're not really that strong and powerful when we're fighting the british but we'll get to that later so let's start with the french and indian war well couple things I want to talk about first with the French and Indian War. As you can see at the top here, it's also called the Seven Years War, and it's from 54 to 63, which is more than seven years. England had a way of looking at how long this war was. We had a way of looking at how long this war was. We called it uh, the French and Indian War. They called it the Seven Years War. It's what it is. So if we say the French Indian War or the Seven Years War, uh, it's the same war, okay? So the conflict isn't just between the French and Indian. You would say, oh, it's, it's a war between the French and the Indian. No, no, no. It's a conflict between France and England, okay? So English was fighting the French, and Native Americans, the American Indians, fought on both sides. They fought with the French, and they fought with the English, Okay, so traditional, immediate, and long-term causes of the revolution really didn't have the same impact on Georgia as it did the other colonies, because this war didn't really happen anywhere near Georgia. It happened right around here in the Ohio River Valley. So you can see right now in this map, Great Britain owes, owns all of this pink land here, and France, you can see, owns a whole lot more of North America land. So right now, both countries are looking to populate North America, the new world, and they're going to have to go to war over it because we have greed and fear of the two different countries, French, or the France and English, but basically greed, we want more, we want more, we want more, and fear. If the other side gets too much, then they might kick us out of the new world as well. So... We have this two major causes. These aren't the only causes of the war, but greed does lead to wanting more and more and more and more. And fear is I'm fearful that the other side might get more land than us and then eventually kick us out of the new world. So greed, we want your land in the new world because you only live once. And you can see a picture of this girl. She's being a little greedy. You ain't touching my dolls. And then we also have fear. Okay, we don't want the other to gain power in the new world. So one way to make sure the other side doesn't gain power, you gain all the power first. So in the war, the British claim that this is all their land, and these are the 13 colonies. All right, the Spanish were still down here in Florida. The French had a claim to all this land that we just saw before. And then this territory right here, the French claimed and the British claimed, so it was kind of like a disputed area of land where they were fighting over what land should we have? Is this British? Is this French? 
French and Indian War is in the Ohio River Valley right here. So we know Great Britain has a great navy because they stole all the boats, the Spanish Armada, and they just are very well like thought of as like the world leader right now because they have the best navy. France, as you can see right here, they have to have a strong army because they started up here and worked their way down all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So they have an army that has walked all of this land here. So they are known for having the best army. Thing is, Great Britain had a strong alliance with six tribes of Native American or American Indians. So did the, so did the French. The France had partners with other tribes as well. So in this picture here, a lot of the, the Native Americans that sided with Great Britain were living here. A lot of the Native Americans or the American Indians that sided with France were living out here. So you had two different like wars going on kind of. France versus England and Native Americans versus Native Americans. It wasn't really all that good. It lasted a long time. So they fought over control over the Ohio River Valley, which was in Ohio, but Ohio doesn't exist yet, which is kind of really, really far from Georgia. So you couldn't really do anything in Georgia during the French and Indian War because it had nothing to do with Georgia. So little impact on the colony of Georgia. It really didn't have anything to do. So now the French Indian War has begun. It's called the Seven Years War in Europe. They thought it, thought it lasted seven years. Yeah, it was a little bit longer than that. But in the first years of the war, France badly defeated the British several times. So France's army was kicking butt to the British all over the place. The battle losses built up in America, the New World, and in Europe. So France is also attacking Europe, or sorry, England in Europe. So this is happening on two different continents right now. You can see a picture here of a battle during the French and Indian War. You can see Native Americans or American Indians fighting with the French and British. And then to make a long story short, Finally, Great Britain won the French and Indian War, okay? So it's, it's, it, it's pretty much quick right there. The French and Indian War, Britain won the French and Indian War, Native Americans fought on both sides. And now because of this, Great Britain now controls a whole lot of land. The Western, Western frontier was now opened. People can go into the new land that was won by defeating the French. The Ohio River Valley is now accessible to all the colonists and all the lands east from the Mississippi River to the ocean now belong to Great Britain. Because of this, Spain also had to give up their land in Florida because they saw the writing on the wall. Everything around them is now Great Britain. They need to leave. France lost all the land from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. Even their toys lose. So this is the British land before 1763. These are your 13 colonies. Now, remember, this used to be all blue. Now the British just gained all of this land, including land down here because the Spanish in Florida said, see ya. So now England, Great Britain, has all of this land from the Mississippi River all the way to the ocean. They are ginormous when the, with the amount of land that they have right now. Skip the videos and go to Georgia's new borders. So because of this war, Georgia now has new borders. Our southern border is now the St. Mary's River. But the most important border really to change is the western border, which now is the Mississippi River. So our border is basically the Atlantic Ocean all the way through Georgia, which we have now the state of Alabama, and the state of Mississippi, all the way to the Mississippi River. Georgia now owns all of that land. The war, because it's now over, they, they added up all the numbers and said, whoa, we owe a lot of money. So now the British economy is going a little bit downhill because they have to pay for all of the war debt from the French and Indian War. So 
King George III says, uh, we need to pay this war debt back. Who should we charge money so that we can now pay the war debt? So here comes the taxes. The colonists are about to start getting taxed. It's not going to be good. I highly recommend you going to exceedthestandard.com and find this video in our presentation. It is amazingly bad and amazingly awesome at the same time. Next section, proclamation of 1763. Mm. King George II died in 1760. So that's three years before the proclamation of 1763. So who wrote the proclamation of 1763? King George's grandson, not his son. His grandson is now taking over because both of George's II's children had died before him. So King George II did have some children, but they died before King George II left his throne. So King George III is actually King George II's grandson. He's taking over. And here's his signature, King George III's signature. It looks fancy. So what is the proclamation of 1763? Well, we know King George III wrote it, issued by King George III. King George II wrote the Charter of 1732. It ended in a two, 1732, King George II. Proclamation of 1763, King George III, 1763, King George III. Stabilized relationships with the American Indians. Right now, we had a big war, the French Indian War. A lot of our relationships with the Native Americans, the American Indians there, were not on good standing. So they wanted to make sure that we respected their land and the area there and the people there. So this basically forbade, it didn't allow, it forbade colonists to go past the Appalachian Mountains. It basically said, okay, you're not allowed to go colonists. You're not allowed to go past the Appalachian Mountains. They didn't like that at all. Here's the proclamation itself. Whereas we have taken into our royal blah, blah, blah. Proclamation of 1763 continues to basically say, because we're in debt, we can't afford another war. We need to make sure we can collect taxes from you. So if you go past the Appalachian Mountains, we can't really collect taxes from you. So we're going to have to keep you on this side because we need to collect taxes from you. And we don't want you to go past it because that's where the Native American land is going to be. So the colonists had a problem with that, obviously, because many of them fought for Great Britain during the war because we were British. They were promised land west of the Appalachian Mountains during this war, saying, if we win this war, colonists, you can go west of the Appalachian Mountains because now that will be our land. So fight for us, attack the French, and then you can have all this extra land. So that's what they thought was going to happen because it was promised to them. They hoped to gain all this new land, but since this proclamation of 1763 happened, they're like, uh, whatever. So they kind of ignored the whole proclamation thing, and many, many, many moved and settled into the new lands in the American Indian land, it totally ignoring the grandson, the guy they don't really know, the king's grandson. They ignored his proclamation in 1763. They were so, so angry, all right, because, again, it stopped them from getting new land, and if you don't have new lands, you don't have new money. So they were really upset about not being able to go into the new land that was won in the French and Indian War from the Fran or from the French. So remember what class is it's called? It's called Georgia Studies. So what about Georgia? Well, they're not really so mad about the proclamation of 1763 because we're still living on the coastline. Remember, we just got here not that long ago. So we're really dependent on Great Britain. They bring us food supplies, clothing, everything on the boats from the motherland to Georgia. We are totally dependent on Great Britain, on King George III now. So we're doing whatever he wants us to do because you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Georgia also gained land after the war thanks to Spain leaving Florida. So now Georgia had land to the south of where they normally were in Georgia thanks to Spain leaving after the French Indian War. 
which leads us to the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act is a direct result of the French and Indian War. So they go together. Okay. The war debt had to be repaid of the French and Indian War. Parliament said colonists had to help pay the debt because, you know, England was protecting the colonists from the, the French threat. And uh, yeah, you're going to have to pay for that. So taxes are now here. Before the French Indian War, the British government had let the colonies collect taxes for themselves. But when they did that, the colonies' taxes stayed in the colonies. So they weren't really taxed by the English government. They were taxed by themselves. And the money that they used through taxes stayed in the communities, which is what taxes are supposed to do. They're supposed to help your community. Now, the problem is the colonists were being taxed directly by Great Britain, which means all the money being taxed by Great Britain to the colonists weren't going to stay in the 13 colonies. They were going to go back on a boat back to England to help pay, pay England's war debt of the French and Indian War. The colonists were not very much fans of that because they had no actual representation in Parliament. So what that means is no one of the colonies were able to vote, yes, we should tax us, or no, we shouldn't, or give reasons for or against it, because no one was invited to make those decisions over in England. They kind of said they have, they have no say in the new taxes, and they were right. They were basically being told, you are going to have to pay more money now, like it or not. Which is where you get the terms that you've probably heard before, no taxation without representation. You can't tax us without us being present to vote on this at all. That's our representation. No colonists were there to vote on it. So the first direct tax after the French and Indian War was the Stamp Act of 1765. This tax was not a tax on stamps like you put on an envelope when you put it in the mail. This was a direct tax on all paper products, newspapers, licenses, any legal documents, books, playing cards, even dice, even a game of dice was going to be taxed to help pay for the war. And this is what they looked like. So you can see this stamp, <clears throat> this stamp was like embedded, it's pressed down into the paper. So you can see that that's there. You also had different stamps of ink. Like you would have a normal press and then you just put it on a piece of paper and then it would say one penny sheet. Uh, these are the stamps that were used to charge the colonists more money to pay for things. And the colonists had a problem with that because they're like, no, we're not paying for your war. So everyone in the north, they were swift and violent with their reactions. Colonial leaders from most of the colonies spoke out against the act and saying, no, this is wrong. We're not going to do that. And the average citizens, just remember this, right now, we're pretty much average citizens. We would have reacted violently in the northern colonies. Violently. They hung effigies. Now, what's an effigy? It's a likeness of a public official. Okay, Parliamentary leaders and royal governors were portrayed in effigies. And it basically was this. Think of a scarecrow dressed in some specific outfit, maybe a British soldier or a tax collector outfit. And the colonists would dress them as that person. They would put a noose around that, that scarecrow's neck, if you will, raise him up and set him on fire. Uh, that's how upset they were that they were literally burning hay or straw filled people to show their displeasure in the Stamp Act. They also attacked the homes of the British officials and the craziest part of all, they tarred and feathered tax collectors. Now, if you don't know what that is, tarred, if you look outside on a road and you see the road cracked and then piece of like black something on it, that's tar. But it's, it's hardened. It's not burning up right now. But back then, they would have warm tar, pour it on people, and then throw a bucket of feathers on them because they were all upset about being taxed extra money. It all had to do with money, ta being taxed extra money. So the people that were, their job, their only, their only crime was that it was their job. 
They were the tax collectors for England. They were coming to collect the taxes from the colonists. The colonists were like, mm, not only are we not giving you money, we're going to give you some warm tar and then feather you. And then if that didn't work and you didn't die then, we would probably just hang you up right there and, you know, you would die. The tax collectors would die. So this is a picture of unhappy colonists tarring and feathering a tax collector. His only crime was doing his job of collecting taxes and the colonists had nothing of it. In Boston, there was a riot. In New York, there were protests. Everyone was very upset. So we got a group of people together and called it the Stamp Act Congress, which met in New York. Nine of the 13 colonies are represented. Of course, Georgia was not there. And they wrote a letter to the king to say, hey, here's what you're doing. Here's what we're doing. We don't like the Stamp Act. I know you need to repay the war debt that you guys have, but it's not going to be this way. So they went and met and they voted. Should we write a letter to King George the Third? Yes, we should. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay. It, it was bad. So do you think the King George the Third, remember the ruler of all the world, is going to listen to the puny little colonists that he doesn't care about? We're going to find out shortly. Some protest groups in Massachusetts, you might have heard the Sons of Liberty. Think of any American Revolutionary War name. They probably were in the Sons of Liberty. We're not going to go over that now because this class is Georgia Studies, which means in Georgia, we had a group called the Liberty Boys that protested the Stamp Act as well. So not everybody in Georgia was for the Stamp Act, and not everyone was against either, obviously. We're going to skip our videos and go straight to what did King George do when he got the letter from the colonists. Well, Parliament decided to actually repeal, which means remove the Stamp Act as a law. It is no longer a thing. The Stamp Act is over. When the colonists found out about that, they were, yay, woohoo, they were all excited. But what they didn't know was that even though Parliament repealed the Stamp Act, Parliament was also passing a whole bunch of other acts that saying, oh, okay, you don't want to do the Stamp Act. This is what you're going to have to do now. And other taxes now are being set towards the colonists, and they're starting to get angry. So what was George's reaction? Eh, again, not as violent. You remember, we're a small population. We had a strong governor named James Wright. And we, again, remember, we really depended on Great Britain and the king for our survival. They kept sending us stuff. We needed the stuff to survive. We were the only colony to actually sell the stamps during the Stamp Act, although some resisted it. We were the only colony to actually do it. All right. And even though we did that, we did have some prominent, some important Georgians speak out about the Stamp Act. But because of this, because we actually did implement the Stamp Act tax, well, remember, it's on all paper products. So the Georgia Gazette, the newspaper that was running in Georgia, no longer was running in Georgia because the Stamp Act tax made it too expensive for the newspaper to be sold and bought. So the whole Georgia Gazette newspaper had to fold. It, it went out of business, business because the Stamp Act was too expensive and they could not run their company anymore. So question, which statement best describes how the French and Indian War led to the America's Revolutionary War? So basically, how do we get from the French and Indian War to the American Revolution? Look at all of our answers here. Great control of Canada. We never talked about Canada. France lost Louisiana territory. We're not talking about that yet. To get revenge, France incited a rebellion in the colonies and enticed Spain to move into the territory. No, Spain did not move in. They moved out. So our best answer is to get money to repay war debts. Great Britain taxed the colonies on the premise that the war had been necessary to protect the colonists from the French. How did the military of the French and British compare during the French and Indian War? Well, remember, we said the French had the better army. The British had the better navy. So let's see if we can find an answer here. The British had the strongest navy and army. 
Nope. The French had the strongest navy and army. Nope. So it's got to be C or D. The French forces had more experienced military leaders, but lacked a strong army. French had a great army. So a C is not an answer. So our best answer has to be, and our only answer has to be D. The French had a number of alliances with the Indians. True. But the British had a larger number of troops. True. That just basically means, guys, the British had more people to die for the cause than the French did, which is why they won the war. What law forbade colonists to move west of the Appalachian Mountains? The Intolerable Acts? Nope. Yes. Proclamation of 1763. What was the first direct tax by Parliament on the colonies? which caused everyone to unite against King George III. And by everyone, we pretty much mean everybody. But our best answer is the Stamp Act, obviously. And then finally, which British policy had the greatest effect on Georgia? The British increased an existing tax on wine. Never talked about that. The British required the colonies to ship their goods only on British ships mm, on Georgia. This really doesn't affect Georgia that much. The British passed the Stamp Act, adding a tax on newspapers and licenses. Yeah, that affected Georgia. And the British passed the Sugar Act to tax. We didn't really talk about that. So our best answer is C, the Stamp Act, because we were the only colony to sell stamps, which put our newspaper out of business. That's the end of our video. Hope you enjoyed it. Our next video will be on 3.b. Remember to go back to exceedthestandard.com for any more of your Georgia study needs. Thanks a lot and have a great rest of your day.